Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Jerry Taylor. I'm one of the co-chairs for the ACHA COVID-19 Task Force. I'm also the former Associate Dean for Health Counseling and Health Promotion at Bentley University in Waltham, Mass. This is the first of our Ask the Expert series that we're going to be hosting over the next two months. Our goal is to provide brief presentations with then time for our um, participants to ask questions. Um, again, the presentations will be brief. If we don't get to your question, what, what our hope is, is to have those answered and to send you the recording of the session as well as the copy of the slides along with some of those questions that might not have been answered, although we'll try to get to all of them. Um, just a reminder that we have the latest updates on the ACHA COVID-19 resource page. That's a link on the ACHA homepage. And also be sure to check your weekly ACHA COVID-19 update emails. There's a lot of good information on them. Um, and continue to use ACHA Connect um, where people are sharing questions, answers, and solutions. It's a great resource for you. Finally, um, we encourage you to attend our second COVID virtual summit on December 8th and 9th. Um, questions can be asked by the, through the question panel on your screen. And again, we'll try our best to get to all of them. So I'm pleased today to introduce our three speakers on wastewater surveillance. Amy Kirby is an environmental microbiologist and national wastewater surveillance system lead at the CDC. Casey Ernst is a professor and program director of epidemiology as well as a distinguished scholar in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the College of Public Health at the University of Arizona. And Sean Norman is an Associate Professor and Director of Mo Molecular Microbiology, hope I got that right, Sean, uh, Laboratory in the Devar Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina. These three are certainly experts in their field. So I welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us. And now I'm gonna turn the program over to Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, and I wanna start by thanking ACHA for convening this webinar. Um, it is very much a hot topic, um, as I'm sure all of you know, um, within uh, universities and also within wastewater surveillance. Um, and so I really appreciate this opportunity um, for us to talk about this specific use of wastewater surveillance um, and what it can do and what it can't do. Um, as uh, Jerry said, my name is Amy Kirby. I am, uh, my normal home office is with the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at CDC where I'm an environmental microbiologist, but I'm currently deployed to the COVID-19 response in the Community Interventions and Critical Populations Task Force where I lead our uh, wastewater work. Next slide. So just a little bit of background about why we are even thinking about wastewater surveillance for a respiratory infection. <clears throat> um, one of the things that is really striking about um, the SARS type coronaviruses, so this is SARS-1 as well as um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is that it is shed in feces. Um, and so we see that you know, very early in infection, and in some cases we've even seen reports of um, virus being detectable in feces prior to it being detectable in respiratory infections, um, we see that viral RNA is detected in stool at very, very high concentrations. Um, it seems to happen regardless of symptoms. So it happens whether you go on to become symptomatic or stay asymptomatic. It happens in adults, it happens in children. Um, so it really seems to be a very nice, um, reliable uh, marker of infection. Um, the, the percent of people uh, shedding in stool really varies from study to study, but a recent meta-analysis suggested that on average, um, about 50% of cases have detectable um, virus in stool, which is actually a, a pretty good um, reliable number. And while we know a lot of those cases may not go to the doctor, they may not get tested, the one thing they will do is they will go to the bathroom. 
Um, and in most um, U.S. households and facilities, that um, waste is going to be captured by a wastewater system um, and delivered to a treatment plant. Um, and so the incoming sewage into those wastewater treatment plants can be used as a pooled community stool sample. And so we can take a sample coming into that wastewater treatment plant and essentially um, test it um, in place of testing um, the people that contributed to that. So it's a very efficient way um, to test a large population and understand what the infection prevalence may be at that population level. Um, one of the reasons that we really like it, again, it um, captures those subclinical infections. So even people that aren't symptomatic um, may be shedding uh, virus in stool so we can capture those. Uh, the reason I really like it is that it's independent of healthcare seeking behaviors. So again, doesn't matter if you go to the doctor, it doesn't matter if you're insured, it doesn't matter if you get tested, doesn't matter if you're in a system where your healthcare capacity is completely overwhelmed. Um, wastewater surveillance can provide um, reliable data in all of those situations, which really gives it great power. Um, and we also know that it's fast. Um, so these systems um, deliver uh, waste to the wastewater treatment plants within a matter of hours. They're very efficient. Um, and so if we can collect that sample and get it tested quickly um, and get that data back to the end user um, within, you know, a few days of the, the results being available, we can have actionable data um, within a week versus the two week lag um, that we see for a lot of our clinical indicators. So this can be a very early indicator of what's going on in the community, which makes it particularly valuable. Next slide. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea of what this data uh, might look like. Um, so what we're showing here is data from a single sewer shed. So again, this is at the community level, so not necessarily on a university campus. But if we're taking samples from a uh, wastewater system, this is what you could expect to see. Um, so the, the raw wastewater data is shown here in black dots. Um, because there's a lot of variability, we um, do a seven day rolling average to smooth that out. And that's what that black line is. Um, because we're only sampling two or three times a week, we can't smooth it totally out. So it's still kind of jumpy, um, but you can definitely see some trends, right? So in, in early um, April uh, or late April and early May, we really weren't detecting much. There was a little um, increase around Memorial Day, which we all know is the Memorial Day spike, and then it went back down. Um, and then unfortunately in, in late June and early July, we start seeing those concentrations go back up. Um, and that does correlate with what we see in cases. So you can see um, the gray bars in the background here are new cases reported um, by date of symptom onset. And so you can see there's a nice correlation there with where we're seeing um, wastewater increases, we see case increases as well. Um, so we have done uh, at CDC an analysis of this and shown that in fact, wastewater trends do correlate with new cases. Um, so it does seem to be a measure of incident cases occurring, um, even though it's technically a prevalence measure. Um, and that wastewater data tends to lead case data by on average four to six days. Um, so we have statistical support that this is in fact um, a leading uh, indicator of community infection prevalence. One of the ways that we report this data um, is by assigning trend classifications um, to the wastewater data. And you can see that for this graph at the bottom. Um, so the sewage trends, if you're red or yellow, it means that the RNA concentrations are going up um, and that we expect that the infection prevalence in your community is increasing. Uh, if they're going down, then it's green or dark green. And if they're plateaued, then it's red. And so by just looking at that bar, you can see quite quickly that Again, April and early May, you were doing good. Um, and then in late May, it started going up and it's really hasn't come down since. Um, so that's a very quick way um, to see uh, how any individual uh, sewer shed is behaving. Next slide. So with that evaluation in mind, we are moving forward with the National Wastewater Surveillance System, um, NWSS. We pronounce that news because any good government program needs an acronym. Um, this is a good overview of how that system is set up. Um, so again, the new system is really targeting that community level surveillance. So our communities are producing wastewater that's going to the wastewater treatment plants. The utilities are collecting those wastewater 
uh, samples at their influent um, to the plant. That's then uh, sent to one of our news uh, laboratories, and that's a real patchwork of academic labs, commercial labs, um, and some public health and environmental health labs um, where they will uh, measure the amount of SARS-CoV-2 RNA um, in those samples. That data is then submitted to the state or local health department, um, and they will input that data into our um, news decipher portal uh, that's housed at CDC. And what that portal does is it acts as one, a data repository for national wastewater surveillance data, but it also houses an analytic engine that does basic data cleaning and quality checks. Um, it also normalizes the data for human fecal input. Um, so the easiest way to imagine that is, you know, we have some systems where storm water flows into uh, sanitary sewer systems. So they're combined systems. And so you can imagine in those systems, if it's really rainy and there's a lot of storm water flowing into the system, your signal would go down, but it doesn't really mean that you have fewer cases. It's just because it's diluted. Um, so we wanna have some measure of what the human fecal input is so that we can account for that. Um, and the Decipher engine does that normalization on the back end um, using the data that's submitted to it. Um, and then, we do those trend classifications and we provide all of that data back to the health department as the end user of this data so that they can incorporate it into their decision making um, for the response. Um, and then another thing that CDC surveillance systems do is we always um, do national summary data for any of our surveillance systems. So we'll be doing that as well and sharing it through um, things like publications in our morbidity and mortality weekly report um, but also sharing that out um, to partners and making it public on our website. Uh, next slide. So we think this surveillance data can be particularly useful um, to provide county and sub-county level total infection trend data. Um, so we're really looking at are the community infection levels going up, are they going down, or are they stable? Um, it's not going to provide a single prevalence number. Um, we do think it can be very useful as a leading indicator of infection increases, um, especially after changes in community uh, mitigation strategies. So, uh, you know, asking whether, you know, for instance, reopening bars or hair salons or any of the things that are coming back online, what is the impact of those things um, on community infection levels? Um, we, it can also be used to inform reclosure decisions. If you're seeing consistent high um, and increasing levels in wastewater, um, you might want to consider implementing additional community mitigation strategies. Um, and although this isn't a, a priority right now, um, this approach can also be used to track virus evolution and global origin if we add sequencing um, into it. Um, and so that is a, a long-term goal for the system, not something that we're working on right now. Um, the one thing that I really want to emphasize is right now, wastewater data cannot be used to provide a point estimate of prevalence. So it cannot tell us what percentage of people in the community are infected. It can't tell us how many people are infected. Um, and really that's because the, the data on fecal shedding in, in uh, sick people that is necessary to model um, those infection prevalence numbers that data is just not robust enough right now to give us a precise estimate. So any model that produces those prevalence estimates has such large uncertainty around it that it's really not um, a useful number. Um, it's just too uncertain. Next slide. So as promising as wastewater surveillance is, there are some limitations that have to be acknowledged up front. Um, the first is that not all um, facilities and residences are on wastewater systems. Um, so we call these decentralized wastewater treatment facilities. Um, the most common in the US is septic systems. So if your house is on a septic system, you're not contributing to the wastewater system. We will not pick your house up um, with this wastewater surveillance approach. And about 25% of households in the US are on uh, septic. In addition, we have a lot of facilities now moving to on-site wastewater treatment. So they're collecting their own wastewater and treating it locally as opposed to sending it into the municipal system. So some whole facilities um, may not be on the, the centralized wastewater system. So it's important to know not only who is contributing to your sample, but also who isn't. Who are you missing with this approach? 
Um, we also, uh, one of the things that is just a bedrock of any environmental sampling is that we do not um, add any interpretive weight to a negative sample. So if we don't detect um, SARS-CoV-2 in a wastewater sample, we cannot say that that community is free of COVID um, because our limit of detection is something greater than zero. It always is. Um, we could just have not sampled enough or at the exact right time or in the exact right place. Um, and so we just don't interpret those negatives um, to be a, a way of, of clearing a community. Um, and finally, for any sewage uh, systems, you want to know if there's any kind of pretreatment that's happening. Um, a lot of our municipal wastewater systems will treat their sewage coming into the plant either for odor control or worker safety. Um, and those pretreatments can uh, make it harder to accurately detect um, the virus in that wastewater. And so we'd want to know about any pretreatment that might be happening um, there as well. Next slide. So all of that was really focused on the community level, which is where our new system is really focused. Um, but there's also a lot of interest in applying this approach um, at the building or facility level. So at CDC, we call those targeted use cases of so targeted surveillance. Um, primarily the interest is for long-term care facilities and nursing homes, universities, as we're talking about here today, um, and also correctional facilities. Um, and one of the things that <laughs> I have been a little surprised to learn through all of this is those three facilities have a lot in common. Um, they are all residential, they have large residential populations, and in each case, it can actually be really challenging to do accurate prevalence screens. So, you know, ideally testing all of your residents, you know, once a week, um, there are barriers to doing that in all of these groups. Um, and so that solution is challenging to implement. Um, which makes wastewater surveillance really, um, really of interest and particularly um, promising. And why are we interested in that? Um, again, it could be an early warning for new cases. So maybe we'll see it in wastewater before a person will even be symptomatic. Um, again, because they start shedding very early and even if they're asymptomatic. Um, it may be a more efficient approach to surveillance. So taking those um, wastewater, system, wastewater samples, you know, even if you're doing daily samples from a facility, that's going to be a lot fewer samples than if you're testing every resident in that facility. Um, and because of that, um, it may be cheaper um, than prevalence testing uh, for the full facility. And you can see, I know everyone on this call has seen these. Um, this is just the early um, headlines about some of the successful implementations of wastewater surveillance at, at universities across the country. There have been many, many more, um, so I won't spend time on those. Next slide. So as promising as that is, again, I want to point out that there's some limitations and I think you'll hear more about um, this sort of cost benefit um, analysis from our other speakers today. Um, but again, the, the real hurdle here is that the surveillance limit of detection is unknown. And what that means is we don't know how many people need to be infected in a system, in a dorm, in a campus in order to be reliably detected in wastewater. You might get lucky and, and get a positive with a very low number, but what we really wanna know is how many need to be there for us to always detect it, right? Um, and that really changes how you interpret um, uh, the use of this data. Another challenge is that in many facilities, wastewater may not be accessible for sampling. Um, generally, it's something that you want to limit as much contact with as possible because in addition to um, SARS-CoV-2, there are lots of other pathogens in it. Um, so those pipes tend to not be very accessible. Um, and so sometimes getting an, a, a meaningful wastewater sample actually means retrofitting your plumbing to plumb in some more access points. Um, although it's just a few samples, these are very expensive tests to run. Um, depending on what method you're using and what lab is doing the testing, it can run anywhere from $250 to $1,200 per sample. Um, so this is not a cheap undertaking. Um, it also requires multiple samples per week and pretty fast turnaround in order to be useful for response. Um, so again, our emphasis is really on trends. And if you want to see trends, you need three samples. Um, so the closer those three samples are together in time, the better your trends will be. So if you're sampling three times a week, you can get weekly trends. If you're sampling twice a week, you can get bi-weekly trends and so on. And again, that turnaround needs to be very, very quick. 
um, so that you can get that data back and in the hands of the end user so that they can act on it. Um, I will note, and, and we'll probably hear more about this from um, specifically Sean, but also Casey, there is no standard method for this. Uh, and frankly, we don't expect there to be a standard method coming anytime soon. Um, so there's a lot of methods being uh, used and, and we have to deal with that, um, that question about comparability um, as we look at the different methods being used. Um, and finally, I also want to note that there is a competition for resources, both lab capacity, so a lot of our, um, particularly the academic labs that are doing this work, are really stretched to capacity, trying to help with community surveillance, campus surveillance, their own research, which is what's really their bread and butter. Um, and so they have been um, real rock stars, but they are definitely at their limit. Um, there is also now we're seeing shortages in lab supplies, um, which is also driving some methodological changes, which we're having to deal with. Um, and the sampling equipment is backordered in many cases. Um, so even if you wanted to implement this, there are some hurdles to doing it um, already in place. Um, and that's competition with other wastewater surveillance efforts. So um, a lot of the efforts that are ongoing at universities are competing with, you know, other local um, community level surveillance efforts, but also potential impact on clinical testing. So some of those lab supplies that we're using for wastewater testing um, are produced by the same companies and with the same reagents um, that are being used for clinical testing. Um, so CDC is trying to keep an eye on all of that and make sure that um, we're using our supplies and, and capacity where it can make the most um, have the most impact um, and trying to support those uh, supply chain issues where we can. Next slide. Yeah, so I think that's it for me. Um, I think I will turn it over to Sean uh, and then Casey and they can provide a lot more insight on, you know, what this looks like on a university campus. Sean? Okay, thanks Amy. That was a, a great overview of sewage, su sewage surveillance, so I can skip a lot of what I was going to say there. So again, my name is Sean Norman. I'm an associate professor at the University of South Carolina um, in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences. So my lab has really been part of sewage surveillance since really end of March, early April, where we've been doing a lot of statewide and nationalwide um, sewage monitoring um, across 11 different sewer sheds. So I, I kind of bring to this a little bit of the larger scale municipality screening approach, but then scale down to the university campus level. We began optimizing our campus um, sewage surveillance network here uh, over summer with the knowledge that we were going to be going fully online in fall. So this became one of the priority points that the, the university administrators lean toward. So I'm going to give a brief overview of how we've implemented the sewage surveillance on our campus. Now, I can't go into details on everything, but I'm going to try to cover as much as I possibly can. Okay, so as the show it on the slide here, University of South Carolina, on the map we're showing the University of South Carolina system. So the, out, the little red dot outlined in the yellow box is what I'm going to be talking about mainly today. That's our flagship campus located in the state capital in Columbia, South Carolina. As far as the Carnegie designation is considered, we are actually considered a R1 doctoral university with highest research activity. The campus is sprawled across a little over 359 acres located in the downtown Columbia, South Carolina area. And we have approximately 35,000 students and you can read the breakdown here. Most of those are undergraduate students. Um, and those students, those that are staying on campus, mainly reside in 25 different resident halls that we have on campus. Now we also have several very large apartment complexes that are in the immediate proximity to the university where we also have a lot of our student population living. In the fall semester, I wanted to kind of give a breakdown on how the university is functioning right now because that plays a little bit of role in what we're dealing with on our campus. So if you look at the area that says courses, that's talking about how many courses are 100% online, how many courses are face-to-face -face or have a hybrid type system. 
and we break that down into the undergrad and the graduate and professional type of courses. So at the under, for the undergraduate courses, we have about 42% of those that are 100% online with 58% being a face-to-face -face or some sort of hybrid based system. And that percentage is very different when you go to the graduate courses and the professional courses with 14% being online and, and a majority of those 86% being face-to-face -face or a hybrid type system. Okay. okay, next slide, thank you. So in terms of what we've been dealing with on the campus as far as COVID-19 is considered, this is our dashboard and this is as of September the 21st. What I want you to see here is that Currently, we have a total of 90 students that are, have active cases of COVID-19, five employees, totaling 95. Now, this is on the low end now. We did go through a spike relatively recently, and you can see we've had total recovered since August 1st, 2,209 students, 34 employees. But if you look down at that first blue box on the left, that's what I want you to see is that reading from right to left in this case, um, the percent positive of the students here has gone from 10.6 down to 3.2. So while we've had a high percentage, we've also reduced that percentage over time. So we're seeing a reduction in the number of positive students on our, on our campus. We have lots of different type of testing going on through our student, student health services. We also have a saliva-based rapid response team that is able to provide a fast turnaround sampling and process a thousand samples a day. So we have both of those available for the students. Some of those are, like I said, based on saliva testing. Others are based on nasopharyngeal swabs. But if you look on the right-hand side, that the blue box on the right hand side outlining environmental monitoring that's really what we're talking about today and that's our terminology for sewage surveillance we call it environmental monitoring and that's what i'm going to talk about in the next few slides okay next slide please so at the campus level so there are some logistical questions that you have to ask when you're scaling down from the municipal level like amy was talking about earlier um, down to the campus level. So we're looking at community services. One little part on that figure on the left shows all the different diagrams feeding into a municipal wastewater treatment plant. And we're, we're kind of scaling down to one little aspect, that's community services. In this case, we're talking about universities. So there's some logistical questions when we scaled our approach down from the wastewater treatment plants down to our campus. And some of these questions I'll, I'll kind of talk through with you because it might help you in deciding, you know, what, how you want to approach this, this question as well. So the first question we looked at was the question of safety. Okay, I think we still are inconclusive as to the infectivity of the virus in sewage. I think those studies are possibly ongoing. There have been some conflicting studies suggesting that the virus released in fecal material may be inactive, but I don't think those are conclusive studies. There have been some other studies who've, who've indicated that the virus could be um, infective. So I think we have to look at the safety procedures. As Amy also mentioned, you're working with sewage, which the SARS-CoV-2 is the one of many pathogens that's contained in, in sewage. So when you're looking at the source, in this case, you're, you're looking at minutes away from the source of the fecal material versus a municipal wastewater treatment plant where you're looking at hours and maybe up to a day contact time before you actually receive a sample from that facility. Here you're looking at the matter of minutes. So considering the sample as possibly infective, we, we here on our campus take the precautionary principle and just assume that all samples we're dealing with could be infective and from some pathogen or another. So we, we wear our N95 mask, we wear goggles, we wear gloves, and we, we go through a lot of bleach in the lab as well as out, out in the field. So you have to really 
consider the type of personal protective equipment that you're using for this study. Okay. And if you look at the next question on sample location, so that was a that was a big deal for us trying to understand how we're going to sample such a sprawling campus. You know, I mentioned over 359 acres. We have lots of buildings. We have res 25 resident halls, not to mention classrooms and office spaces. So this is really going to be a question that is dependent upon each individual campus layout. How big is the campus? How connected is the campus? Does the campus have a centralized wastewater treatment plant? We don't. We have many, many connections on our campus leading to the city, um, city main sewage line. So trying to understand how the sewage pipes run through the campus was one of our first challenges digging up all the old maps for the sewer system on this campus was a bit of a challenge, but this is where working in partnership with our facilities was incredibly important. Um, so we actually sat down with our facilities um, experts here and looked at the sewer maps and tried to decide how we could best sample um, a majority of the campus with the limitations of, you know, what you would normally have in a lab for sample processing. So we knew up front we were not going to be able to sample every single building on our campus. That's just not feasible, uh, at least here. And so what we decided to do was approach our university kind of in a grid type pattern where we kind of overlay campus with a grid and, and said, what can we do to capture quadrants within this grid pattern that would allow us to cover the most part of campus? And what we ended up doing is looking, um, if you can go, go back a slide. Yeah, I'm not ready for this slide yet. Go back one slide. Okay, so I'll come back to the, that slide in a, in a moment. But so what we ended up doing is trying to decide, okay, where are the most number of sewage connections, uh, junction boxes, if you will, where we can capture multiple buildings. And that's how we kind of, outlined our sampling plan here is by looking at the junctions. So in many of our junctions, we're not capturing one building, we're capturing multiple buildings in our process. Some of these are office buildings, some of these are, are resident halls coupled with classrooms. So some of them are purely classroom type buildings. So we're trying to capture a, a, a mix between office space, classroom space, and resident halls to see how the burden of the virus was around campus. Like where there are hot spots where we need to spend more of our effort trying to identify um, and go in and target individual level testing. And I'll come back to the other side. We ended up uh, narrowing down to 20 different sites and I'll show that on the next slide. So the next thing you have to think about is sampling, sampling frequency. So we were trying to decide how we would best sample on campus. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I am part of a, a larger monitoring network that we have going on. So we had some logistical considerations we had to have in the lab as to when we would be sampling on campus so that we could process the samples. You know, the, the sample processing that occurs uh, is the same regardless of where you get samples from. So we were having intra-lab competition for a lot of our equipment to be able to process the samples. So we had to try to choose um, the days when my, my, my other projects were lower in, in processing needs. So we ended up focusing on twice a week on a Tuesday and a Friday. So that allowed us to get kind of two data points, as Amy mentioned, to try to at least understand a weekly trend uh, occurring. Now I say a Tuesday and a Friday, we do have some auto samplers. So I'm kind of jumping around here a bit and I'm sorry, it calls for some jumping around. So we do put out some auto samplers and those auto samplers are deployed on a Monday and a Thursday. So they collect over 24 hours, over a 24 hour period. And then we pick those up on a Tuesday and a Friday, okay? And that leads me into the next part about collection method. So how do you collect the samples? And this is a, a kind of a big question because the equipment you need to collect composite samples 
are, are oftentimes back ordered these days because of a rush of ordering composite samplers. We also call them auto samplers. Matter of fact, we have a, an order that we're waiting for here at the university that hopefully will arrive in a week or two. But so we have done a combined until our other auto samplers get to this campus. We've combined with using some auto samplers that we already had on campus with also taking grab samples. And a grab sample is just meaning you go out to a, 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 a sewage maintenance hole, you remove the lid and you just take a, a, some kind of container and reach down and grab the sample at a point in time. There are multiple ways you can do a grab sample. You could, you could go out multiple times in a day and grab a grab sample from the same location across a day, but that also gets very time intensive and somebody has to be willing to go out there and collect samples all day long. We have tended to just only go out at one point in time in the day and collect one grab sample. But we, I'll also say that while we're waiting for the larger scale of auto samplers to arrive, we have also been moving our auto samplers that we have available around to different locations on campus to kind of get a baseline of the viral abundance across campus. Now, once you collect the sample, you have to do something with the sample. And that is where it's very different than clinical samples is that you, you're working with sewage here. You can't just go in and immediately um, extract RNA or immediately load this on a machine. With some of our saliva sampling, we actually take that directly from saliva and, and use that directly in a, in a RT-PCR reaction. You can't do that with sewage samples. You have to go through a, a fairly long process. Matter of fact, it's the most time intensive part of this process in our lab at least, where you take the sample, you bring it back, you have to clean the sample up, then you can extract the nucleic acids, in our case the RNA here, then you could run the assay to quantitate the viral abundance. Um, so you have to go through the sample process and there are lots of different ways you can process samples. And that's what Amy was alluding to earlier. There are no standard approaches right now. People are using different approaches. I'll show you my approach on, in a few slides. There are several different ways that you can do the pre-processing. Uh, some of these rely on some, uh, some supplies that are actually a little low. Um, the supply chain is diminished a, quite a bit for some of these supplies. So some people have resorted to other type of mechanisms like um, a PEG precipitation or something like that. Um, so once you get the sample processed and it's ready and you have nucleic acids extracted, you have to then think about what method you're gonna to use to analyze it. And there are two different methods right now. One is RT-QPCR, that stands for reverse transcription quantitative PCR. And another one is a digital droplet type PCR, that's a newer method being used and it seems to be possibly more sensitive than the RT-QPCR methods. But there are also questions on what, how you do that as well. So everything has a question and sub questions to it and there's nothing standardized right now and there's a big push in the field to try to standardize some of these methods so there are not so many people doing things in different ways. Uh, in the RT-QPCR methods, you have standard primers that you can use. Uh, we typically use the standard CDC uh, tested primers, the N1, 2, and 3 primers. We have found that the N2 primer for us gives us the best results. We're able to have highly accurate results, and we are able to get down to um, about 25 viral copies per mil as our detection limit with the N2 primer. So that's what we focused on using. And then once you get the data, you have to do something with the data. And Casey's gonna talk a lot more about that than I am. I'm the microbiologist. I then feed our data up to epidemiologists, but then trying to integrate the data and how do you use the data. And I'll come back to that at the end. So I kind of wanted to give you an overview before I go into some of the more details on how we do things, but just all the types of questions you have to try to ask yourself, okay? So this is really how our sample location looks on our campus. On the left-hand panel, we have about 20 different sites 
that we are testing across campus and you see how spread apart these sites are. Now, when we chose these sites, they were, like I said, based on classroom, office, and resident hall status. But after doing this for quite a bit of time, the graph you show on the, I'm showing on the right here is actually viral density based on sample location. We found that out of many of the sites that we tested, the viral density was, was very low and wasn't really changing a whole lot. There were only a few spots that had higher viral density. So we were actually able to refine our sampling process and go into um, narrowing down the, the focus areas for our sampling to some of these areas that had um, higher viral density. And as you would expect, these are locations that are usually related to student congregations. Um, where, where students are congregating in greater number. So we're not finding it quite as much in classrooms or um, office buildings. We're finding this more in other types of areas of, of student congregation. Okay, next slide, please. So this is an overview. I've already talked a little bit about how we do this. So this is a, an example of one of our auto samplers on the uh, left top panel uh, showing it sitting on top of a maintenance hole here. This pulls a, a 20 mil sample every 15 minutes throughout a 24 hour time period. Then in areas where we don't have auto samplers deployed, we have auto undergraduates, I like to call them. Um, and these are two undergraduate students in my lab who are out sampling, taking grab samples from some of these locations. These samples come back to the lab and we try to immediately process our samples. Everything's kept on ice, even the auto sampler is packed with ice, so the samples are kept cool over a 24 hour period. We bring these samples back into the lab, we blend the samples, then we take them through a centrifugation process, and then ultimately, um, shown on the right, top right hand side of this figure, is the way that we concentrate our samples. So we have to be able to concentrate a large amount of sewage down into small amounts so that we can um, detect the virus. So we use ultrafiltration, then we extract RNA, and then we um, quantify using RT-PCR. Next slide. And this is the end goal here. How do we use the data? The way we've used the data at our campus so far is that we have gone out and where we see high numbers in the sewage that we've tested around campus, we have a rapid response saliva-based team that we can then deploy to some of the individual buildings where we've seen some high numbers. They could go in and do individual level testing. So we have used the sewage surveillance to kind of guide some directed testing. But one of the most important things I'm told by my administration here is that the sewage surveillance also provides an extra level of confidence in the trends that we're seeing on campus. So if the individual level testing numbers are showing increasing or decreasing, our environmental monitoring has been consistent with that, which is independent, as Amy mentioned earlier, is independent of the level of in individual level testing. So it not only allows us to direct some testing, it also provides extra confidence in policies, procedures, or, you know, mitigation strategies that the administration might be um, anticipating. So we use it in two different ways. And I know I'm running a little late, so I'm gonna stop there and let Casey talk about Arizona. Hi everybody. So. Um, I am not the wastewater uh, sort of guru. I am an epidemiologist that gets data on the wastewater surveillance that's being conducted at the University of Arizona and then try to determine what kind of um, information we, we um, will glean from that data and then how to act upon those results that we get. So I've got to put an early shout out to um, Dr. Ian Pepper and Dr. Chuck Gerba as they are the, the leaders in the lab and are the ones that are are doing all of the, this really heavy labor. Um, so the University of Arizona is a Research One institution. It's a Hispanic serving institution located in Tucson, Arizona of about a half a million people. We have approximately 45,000 students, um, most of which are undergrads, but have about 10,000 graduate students. And let's see. Um, the current COVID metrics, so this is just showing sort of where we are. So early on in our, 
early on in our um, sort of first few weeks on campus, um, we started to see a real increase in the number of cases that we were having. Uh, and we are doing testing through multiple strategies. One is we have test all, test smart, which means that we have individuals who are walking up um, for any reason. If they want to get tested, they can get tested. We also have mitigation testing. And so the reason that I'm talking about the mitigation testing here is because this is in part triggered by wastewater results. And then the test smart is having individual random samples um, of on and, and off campus um, employees, which is which is sort of starting to ramp up now that we have more, more capacity for those antigen tests. But you can see that we really had a, an increase there. If you look at that sort of bottom um, left figure with the seven day average positive test results, we really did have a, a, a significant increase several weeks after school um, started. So next slide, please. So currently with the wastewater testing, what I receive back in a file every single day, so the turnaround time is actually very rapid at U of A. Um, they go out and grab the samples in the morning and then they have the results back late at night um, for us to review before the, before the next day. So it's, it's within a you know, eight to 10 hour period. And what we get for each of the places that they're sampling are a non-detect, a level two or a level three of concern. And all of the testing is really focused mostly at, at dorms and at residences because we feel like that's the best way to identify um, sort of who, who these people might be in order to trigger mitigation testing. And so there are um, 11 dorms out of 21 dorms that are currently under surveillance uh, with wastewater. And some of those wastewater sampling sites actually serve multiple dorms. So there's only one location. So you kind of have to you know, figure out that you're going to treat those two dorms or so as a, as a cluster. And then generally they're sampled about two times per week. Um, if you have a level of concern three, they will go in and they'll test more frequently in order to try and see, is there a pattern here? Is this remaining high? Um, and then they are going to plan to expanding their sampling sites to most dorms. Um, there are several that are inaccessible. There's a you know, the only access point is in the middle of a busy street and things like that. So um, not able to, to really access that very well. And then expanding to the Greek system, which is actually off-campus housing for, for University of Arizona, and then potentially to um, off-campus nearby um, apartment housing as well. Next slide. So one of the things that we think through as, as EPIs when we get this data is how do we interpret this? How do you interpret a non-detect? How do you interpret a level of concern two or three? So we sort of put together this um, uh, sort of thought, sort of thinking through what these data mean. So you kind of assume that if you get a positive, that means that there's somebody pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, or symptomatic who is shedding virus that was pooped into the dorm. And the timing of the wastewater is such that if we do follow it up, we will actually be able to identify those people and remove them into isolation, which is the ultimate goal of sort of this process that we're doing. However, when you get a, um, other possible explanations for these positives are that there may be people who are coming in that are not actually resident in that dorm. So if you do a whole dorm testing to try and do that mitigation, you may actually not catch anybody because it could be that it's a guest that spent the night, et cetera, that's not actually a dorm resident. In addition, they could be in a late stage illness. So when people return back from the isolation dorms after about 10 days, they could still be shedding virus. So there is some research that shows that, that the virus could be shed up to two weeks. So if you have a lot of people coming back from isolation, you may actually get some positive virus when um, there's not somebody who's uh, sort of newly infected in the dorm. And then um, you, you could have individuals who were sort of late stage and they're no longer infectious in, in that case. When you get a non-detect, of course, you can assume that you could assume that no one living in the dorm has COVID-19. As M. Amy referred to previously, you know, they, they don't put as much weight on the negative, the negative test results. And, and honestly, um, we, we don't as well. So I'll show some, some data later on because as, as was stated, about 50% of people shed virus in the stool. So you could have a possibility that for some reason, the people that are positive in the dorm aren't actually shedding stool. Um, and there may be, you know, a viral shed that's, that's lower than, than is detectable. And then timing, the timing and variability of the wastewater, particularly at a, at a single building, um, sort of um, 
scenario, it could be much more variable than what you might have at a, at a municipal plant, for example. So that being said, that's sort of what we're thinking through. We ideally, so we really um, have been focusing much more on that, that top sort of left box, but with those caveats in mind uh, related to, to how we interpret the results. So next slide, please. So how do we actually use and leverage the, the sort of resources that we have on campus? Um, so one of the things that I think through is sort of this surveillance iceberg when I think about which weight to put on which indicator, because we're getting all of these data. We're getting the campus health data, the test all test smart, and we're getting the wastewater data, and we have to make decisions based upon an aggregate of the data that's being collected. And when you sort of think through sort of that, that surveillance pyramid, when you have individuals who are reporting to campus health, those folks are, are all going to be symptomatic people that have actually taken the time to go and get treatment um, at, a, at a healthcare facility. And so those really represent sort of the tip of that iceberg, right? And then the, the test all, test smart could be kind of along that spectrum. If we're doing whole dorm um, mitigation testing, you could be picking up people who are just infected but don't have symptoms. Um, and you could also be picking up people that are just sort of starting to have some, some mild clinical symptoms. All right, so I know I only have a couple more minutes. Um, so the wastewater surveillance is really great because it kind of catches that base of the pyramid. However, next slide, I'm trying to go really fast. Um, the campus health, because it's at the tip of the pyramid, if you have a cluster of, cap cluster of cases identified in campus health, that is sort of like that number one trigger to say, okay, there's really something going on in here because if you're seeing the tip of the iceberg, there's probably a whole bunch that you're not seeing. So that's sort of one of the, the main triggers that we use to go in and do a mitigation strategy. But if you have um, wastewater testing results um, that are a high level of concern for multiple days, even if there aren't cases that are being reported through, uh, through campus health or that haven't walked up to the test all test smart, that's also an indicator that would trigger that we would probably want to go in and do some mitigation testing if we had resources. Now, early on, we didn't have a lot of resources, and so we were really having to gear a, a lot more heavily to sort of the campus health um, cases, giving us um, much more weight. But now that we have more resources, our cases have stabilized, um, you know, it'll, that, that sort of dynamic will, will probably change a bit. And next slide. Okay, so some of the limitations, not all dorms can feasibly be monitored. Um, Non-detects should not provide a false sense of security. And since it's usually used as a community level indicator, using it at this building level is, is somewhat unusual. So the science is still evolving and we're all sort of learning together as we go. And then sampling frequency could of course um, impact sensitivity and whether or not you could pick something up because of that variability, which um, Dr. Norman talked about very um, uh, nicely previously. Next slide. And then I just wanted to make sure that everybody um, noted uh, the wastewater PIs on this. Then, and one of the reasons we were able to take off so quickly is because this is what they do. This is their expertise, is looking at water, water quality. And so they had, you know, a lot of things in place and, and were able to gear up to go. Okay. So sorry, that was really, really fast. I hope, <laughs> I hope that that... Um, was useful. Thank you so much our speakers Amy, Shauna, and Casey. You've done a fabulous job. We've covered so much and just so that the people on the line can know you received all the questions ahead of time so you answered many of them if not most of them uh, during your presentation so that's great. I'm going to ask a few. We have about four minutes or five minutes left um, and I I do want to ask you a follow-up question at the end. Um, Casey, how did you determine levels two and three and um, the cutoffs? That's an excellent question, and that is actually not me. That is, um, so what I get, it's, it's based upon the load, and um, that is a cutoff that was given to us by um, Ian and, and Chuck. They actually determined that. So um, they would be the ones that you would want to talk okay, to. Okay, thanks. Another question for you, Casey. Um, they're asking, it seems like the wastewater sampling is more sensitive than the nas nasal swabs. And so they're wondering if, the <clears throat> del if delaying 
NP sampling to five days after the wastewater hit to increase the chance that they'll find the infected cases. What, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, you know, I've thought about that as well. And, you know, I think that what we find is that usually the wastewater is also concurrent with some other things that are signaling that that dorm is, is already starting to, to pick up. So it's also hard to tease out people returning from isolation. So we've got a lot of people returning back from isolation. So really be, to be able to be that specific with the recommendations, I would love to be able to do that and tease that out. And to say, okay, we had a high and then wait five days and, and then test. Um, but typically there's other things that are also going on in that dorm um, that, that lead us to, to trigger that, go in and do the whole dorm testing earlier um, than waiting that five days. But we may stabilize to some point where, where we will be able to do that. Great. Um, Amy, a quick question on labs. Um, colleges are saying, should they use their own labs? Do they hire companies? What's, what's the best way to go? And, um, you know, kind of the quick pros and cons on that. Yeah, so we've seen all of those possibilities. Um, as Casey alluded to, the schools that have um, labs on campus that are able to do this work have really been um, the ones moving forward on this very quickly because they have everything um, already there and ready to go. And, and of course, Sean's in the same uh, situation there at the University of South Carolina. Um, there are commercial labs that offer uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing in wastewater. So you can Google and find a handful of those available as well as some university labs that can do this as a fee for service. Um, so you can find all of those um, options. And we also know there are some, uh, a few state public health labs that are interested in providing this service as well. Um, so in addition to, you know, Google being your friend here, um, I would also recommend contacting your local uh, state health department um, and asking them about resources. Great. How many universities are doing this? Do you have any sense? We are aware at last count of about 30 universities that are either actively doing this or about to start doing it, um, but we only know about the ones that uh, contact us, so we expect that there's more than that um, that are do, actually undertaking do you, it. Do you have any sense of size? You know, I'm looking at these, these two schools are large, quite large, and I'm wondering about the small and medium size, say the schools under 15,000. Yeah, there are definitely some small schools that are undertaking this as well. Okay. Um, again, some of them happen to have this lab capacity on campus and they're able to do it. Um, others are using commercial uh, laboratories to provide that testing or partnering with um, larger, you know, sort of R1 universities that can uh, offer this testing. Thanks. One last question. Um, what do you see happening in the future very quickly, um, Casey, just from a college standpoint, for say the smaller schools as well. Yeah, for the smaller schools. I mean, I think I think it's up to the individual resources what they have and and how they might implement this. I think it's a, a good sort of addition to uh, sort of a suite of indicators that people can be monitoring. Um, and you know, I think yeah, I think we we will certainly continue to use it in our in our planning. Great. Thank you all, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but we, we promise we will do our best to answer the outstanding questions and send them to you with a copy of the recording of this as well as um, the slides. Thanks so much to our speakers. You were fabulous, um, really learned so much today, and thank you to all our participants as well. Have a good day. Thank you.